Good evening. We are glad you're here tonight. We appreciate the attendance of everyone uh, for our Wednesday night Bible class. And um, we want to welcome those who are watching online as well on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. We appreciate you joining us this evening in a virtual way, along with those who are here in the auditorium tonight. We're going to start a series tonight for, I think, uh, four weeks. Um, and uh, Brad Harab is here to speak to us. Brad is a member of the Southern Hills Church and is also the editor of Think Magazine. If I say anything wrong, tell me. Um, editor of Think Magazine, uh, does a lot of seminars about Christian evidences and other uh, Bible topics. And so we are glad to have Brad and his family here this evening. And so he's going to speak to us till about 745, and then we'll ring the bell. We're going to kind of go back to the normal schedule tonight, ring the bell, bring the uh, teenage class back in, and then we'll have the invitation toward the end of the evening. Let's bow in prayer as we begin tonight, and then Brad will come speak. Holy Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for the blessings that you give us. Thank you for our uh, opportunity to come here tonight and study a portion of your word, and we pray that uh, we'll take something home tonight that will strengthen us and challenge us and uh, help to fortify us in our Christian life as we live for you. We thank you, Father, for uh, Brad Harab and the work that he does, and we are grateful that he can be here tonight and for the next few weeks to speak to us and to help us to learn more about your will. Father, forgive us, for we sin often in your sight, and we beg for your forgiveness through the blood of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Brad. Last week I, I received an email from a friend in Memphis, Tennessee, his name is Chris Waite, and he shared with me uh, a very common story point almost a hundred times. Young man who is 16 years old was given a research assignment. He was supposed to write a, a paper on evolution. Long story short, as this young man was perusing through different websites, he began to realize his faith was not nearly as strong as he thought it was. He, he hit websites that were teaching him that things like the flood were, were not real, that evolution was a fact. So tonight, for just a few minutes, what I want us to do is I want us to look deeply at that flood account. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open them up. Genesis chapter 6, we're going to spend quite a bit of time there. If you have been to the Ark Encounter up in Kentucky. They've got a sign on the wall that says, if I can convince you that the flood was not real, then I can convince you that heaven and hell are not real. If you think about that for just a moment, if we can teach our young people that, you know, this didn't really happen, that, that basically the opening chapters of Genesis are just kind of a a parable or a myth then they're going to question every chapter to follow and so we find pages like this on the website the web where skeptics are, are making fun basically poking fun at the flood poking fun at the creation account and let me make sure you understand this 16 year old in Memphis, Tennessee, is by no means alone. There are people in Franklin who are struggling right now with their faith because they stumble across something like this, and the more they dig, the more pages they find. And so tonight, what I want us to do is I want us to answer some of these charges. Is it real? Do we have any kind of physical proof? Let's start with this, this idea about is it fact or is it fantasy? Most of us in this room, when I mention Noah's Ark, unfortunately, these are the pictures that come to our mind. And the reason is because that's kind of what we've been taught since we were like this. Now, this is a Bible class period, so I, I, hopefully you guys don't mind answering questions or asking questions. Somebody tell me what's wrong with that. 
What's wrong with it? Besides the fact that maybe they're not exactly correct from the size, what's the other problem with it? Okay. Rainbow's not exactly the way it should be. What else? What, what does this plant in the heart and the mind of young people? That it's a fairy tale. Anybody in here remember 9-11? All the, the towers coming down. Or for some of you, maybe you remember things like, maybe some of you are old enough to remember the Holocaust. Maybe some of you can remember other tragedies. Anybody think that there was death and destruction around the flood? Remember when Nashville flooded a couple of years ago? What it looked like around that? It didn't look quite this cute, did it? And so what it does is it plants this idea in young people's hearts and minds that all of this is a cute little story. And then they grow up and they start looking at more and more of these books. And all of these books that you see on the screen behind me are painting this similar message that this is just a, a cute little story, not necessarily real. Then your child goes off to a movie, watches something like Evan Almighty where they are making a, a mockery of this account. Or, or maybe we go to 2014, some of you saw this particular movie. I, I hate to even bring it up because about the only thing they got right was it did have water and it did have a boat. So this is a, a major blockbuster movie featuring people like Emma Watson and yet again planning this idea that, you know, the biblical account, totally wrong. This one said Methuselah was on the boat. John Loftus was a Christian, baptized in the church, actually preached for a little while. He eventually left the church. He wrote a book called Why I Rejected Christianity. Listen to what he says. What has happened to me theologically? He said, The watershed for me, and I suspect for others who have changed their assumptions, is the factual and the historical reliability of Genesis chapters 1 through 11. That's it. And I wonder how many other people could say that, that basically, you know, there came a point where I was going to school and I started weighing everything and I just realized, you know what? I can't harmonize what I'm getting in this class with Genesis chapters 1 through 11. And so something had to give. And unfortunately, usually it is the Bible that they give. The reason? Because they haven't really looked at the evidence. Like, if we were to ask the question, if we were to look at the earth for just a moment, we go to, to some of the highest points on the planet in almost every single case you're going to find seashells in fact this is a, a picture from some mountains near Nepal over 20,000 feet in elevation and yet it's covered in aquatic fossils Appalachian Mountains a little closer to home over 6,000 feet in elevation Hopefully I don't have to tell you guys there's not a whole lot of oceanfront property on the Appalachian Mountains. We go to the other coastline towards California. 100 miles in, and you hit a shell reef. Again, covered in aquatic fossils. These are some shells that were collected by a United States serviceman, was doing some time over in Iraq, was able to climb one of the highest points over there, a place called... Chiki Dar, it's over 10,000 feet in elevation. And again, what do you find? Seashells. Now don't miss the point. I'm bouncing you around from continent to continent to continent. All over this planet, what we find is proof for a global flood. In fact, if you go to the highest point, you go to the top of Mount Everest, when climbers get to the very top, they're putting their victory flags into that particular mountain. 
They're putting their flags into the remains of animals that once lived in the sea. Now, why is that a big deal? That's a big deal because if you know anything at all about geography, you know that Mount Everest is not exactly near the coast. In fact, it's about 450 miles away from the closest beach. So the, the question is, how did those seashells get there unless there was a global flood? Now, while we're talking about this area right here, let's talk about China for just a moment. When the very first Chinese missionaries, when they got to that particular country, the people there, they already knew about creation. They knew about the flood. They claimed not to be of Chinese descent, but rather they said they came from Japheth. Now let me prove it to you. Some of you in this room, you know that the Chinese people, they don't use letters the way we do. They, they use characters to make words. Take a look at the Chinese word for boat. It's actually made up of three distinct characters. Vessel, eight people. Why would they use that to describe a boat? Or, or how about this one? The word garden in Chinese is actually made up of the words dust, breath, to enclosure, you add those up, and that is their word for garden. Why in the world would they use those particular symbols for garden? I'll tell you why, because their language goes all the way back to this right here. So when we look at things like the Chinese language, when we look at geography, what we see is, yeah, the earth is crying out that there was a flood. Not just that, what about the earth itself? What about topography? So, for instance, the layers. You don't get rocks that curve naturally. If I were to tell you, hey, go out here on I-65, you know, where they've blown through for the interstate, and you take some of those rocks and curve them, that doesn't happen just by chance. Last week, I was in Montana. Let's see if I can back up here. Right there we go. And, and notice out there, they've got rock layers that are in a curve that, again, clear sign of the flood. All over the planet, what we see is evidence. You've got seashells on top of the rocks. You've got rock layers that are folded on themselves. Again, crying out the fact that, yeah, there really was a flood. All right, so follow me for just a moment. You got seashells on top of the rocks. You got the rock layers themselves that are folded onto themselves. But what about fossils in the rock layers? So we go to somewhere like the Colorado-Utah border where there is the, the National Dinosaur Graveyard you go there today, and one of the things you'll notice, loads and hundreds of dinosaur bones that have been fossilized in the limestone instantly. Now, cows weigh a whole lot, okay? The reason I know that, when I was about seven years old, I got stepped on by one. That hurts, especially if you're seven. Dinosaurs weigh a whole lot more than cows. How do you pick up, say, a, a 40, 50-ton dinosaur, slam it, not just one, but literally hundreds of them, into limestone rock? Well, if you were to go into the ranger station of that particular dinosaur national graveyard, they have a, a picture, a mural on the wall, showing them being swept away by water. And then they've got a little sign that says, after a seasonal, what's the next word? flood now they would go ahead and add millions and millions of years but the point being they recognize you're not going to get those fossils into those limestone walls without some kind of massive flood so evidence wise we've got shells on mountaintops we've got striatal layers that are folded on themselves we got fossils 
in the layers, now we ask ourselves, all right, what other evidence? Obviously, the people I'm speaking to, hopefully all you need is this right here, right? Because if the Bible says it, it happened. Amen? Let me ask you this question. Do you think that maybe our children and grandchildren need more evidence than that? And what I mean by that is, do you think that maybe there are skeptics out there who are challenging their faith even harder than maybe when we grew up? I think so. In fact, I've told a lot of young people, I think during their lifetime, they're probably going to be persecuted in the church. And so... We ask, we say, all right, besides the Bible, what else can we give the young people today? What, what can we give the youth? We got the physical evidence. What about, say, archaeological evidence, writings? Like, what have we dug up that would also support a global flood? Like, do we have ancient writings that mention some type of, of global flood? Again, the answer, absolutely. You find it in ancient cultures like the Greeks, the Hittites, the Sumerians. All these ancient cultures have flood accounts in their history. Now, why is that a big deal? Number one, it's a big deal because it's historical and it's written down. Number two, these are places that are spread all over the planet. And so, again, what we see are these ancient cultures to say, yeah, there was a flood. You've got the Greeks, the Romans, India, basically all early Indo-European cultures tracing themselves back to this guy named Japheth. Ian Wilson said this. He said, surely a real-life flood must lie behind these stories. The collective memory scattered over wide geographical distances is too prevalent too deep-seated for this not to have been the case. Clearly, there are grounds to suspect that what may have often been tossed aside as flood myths have considerable foundation in fact. Okay, so as a scientist, from a evidence perspective, can I prove that there used to be some kind of a flood? Yeah, absolutely. So then the question becomes, all right, was it a local flood? Or was it a global flood? Well, let me point out, hopefully, what should be obvious to everybody in this room. Why in the world would Noah spend almost 100 years working on a boat if all he needed to do was hike a few miles over here to get away from a local flood? Does that make sense to anybody? By the way, does the Bible say that God was going to destroy everything? Yeah, it does. Does that sound like a local flood to anybody? Did God say that he would never flood the world like that again? Yeah. Have there been local floods? Yeah, Nashville had one, right? 18 inches in 24 hours. So do I hold the position that it was a, a local flood? No. God doesn't lie. Here's what that means. That means this thing had to cover the whole earth. Now, a lot of times when you say that, people say, you just, it, it couldn't happen. You know, how, how do you get a boat that could carry that many animals? And, I mean, Brad, it'd just be too small. No one wouldn't have known how to do it. Well, let's take a look at it. Genesis chapter 6. Look with me, starting in verse 14. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark. Cover it inside and outside with pitch. Somebody tell me, what is pitch? Say that a little bit louder. To keep the boat from leaking. Where do we get that from? It's a tar And you know what kind of trees primarily it comes from? Primarily pine family. So, you know how they've got that real sticky residue produces almost like an amber? That's basically pitch. It, it waterproofs things. You notice he says, put it on the inside and outside. If you've ever felt that stuff, 
you know why they use that. Somebody, what's gopher wood? I've had somebody say, oh, that's when God told Noah, hey, go for wood. <laughs> the reality is we don't know for sure. And I think there's probably a good reason why we don't know for sure. You ever notice how good God is at basically removing things that we might tend to worship? Because let's, let's be honest for just a minute. If we knew what gopher wood was, that's all Home Depot would carry. That's what everybody would want their desk made out of. We don't know for sure. He says this. This is how you should make it. The length of the ark should be 300 cubits, the width 50, the height 30. Stop right there. What would have happened if Noah didn't build it to those specifications? What do you think? It would, it would probably have been, maybe bent somewhere in the middle, collapsed on itself. But what, okay, what, but what if Noah said this? You know, God, I know that's what, I know that's what you say, but I feel like it ought to be like this. Is God worried about our quote-unquote feelings when it comes to obeying him? No. Our job is to obey him because he's all-knowing. So if God says, hey, I want you to build a boat like this, what we need to be doing is building a boat like this. Now, we don't use cubits today. We use things like feet, yards, inches. If we were over in London, I would be saying meters, millimeters, centimeters. Somebody define, what's a cubit? About 18 inches. He's right. So basically it's the length of, of a forearm. There were two back then. There was actually a royal cubit, a Babylonian cubit. Average length of a man's forearm is 18.34 inches. So if we round that down to his 18, which is, I think, correct, that means this boat was 450 feet long. It was a football field and a half. Now, the very next verse, if you look in your Bible, he tells him to put three decks on it. In fact, let me flip over there. He says, you shall make a window for the ark. You shall finish it to a cubit from above. Set the door in the ark on his side. You shall make it with the lower, second, and third decks. So knowing that, knowing how much floor space, knowing how many stories it was, you can calculate volume. And I've done that, and I can tell you guys, using a very conservative 18-inch cubit, this thing would have 1.39 million cubic feet of storage space. 1.39 million. But since that number is really too big for any of us to get our hands around, how about we do this? How about we go to the closest train track, which I guess is that way, we wait until some of those massive box cars start rolling by, and then we start counting them. And we get all the way up to say, oh, about 52. Anybody in this room want to wait on a train that's got 52 box cars? My wife will tell you, I'm a little bit ADD, okay? So after like four or five boxcars roll by, I'm looking at that gap thinking, I think I can make that. <laughs> 52, right? Here's the deal. You take that 52 and you add nine more trains just like that one till you get up to about 522 railroad boxcars. Question, who created all the animals? God did. Do you think he knows how big a boat he needs for the animals he created? Yeah. All right, somebody says, yeah, but still, Brad, you know, how, how are you going to build a boat that big? I mean, how, how big exactly is 522 railroad boxcars? If you go down to Pier 39 in San Francisco, uh, which I would not recommend right now, 
I used to tell people, you know, if you're in San Francisco, go down to Pier 39. I don't recommend going to San Francisco anymore because that city has changed a lot in the last five years. But if you're there, you go down to the docks, there is a boat that is actually basically permanently docked. It's the last ship of an entire fleet known as the Liberty Ships. In my teaching, I have run across at least five or six guys who actually spent time on the Liberty Ships. The Liberty Ships were kind of what helped us win the war because finally we could build boats quicker than the, the Germans could sink them. I'd heard about these things long before I ever got to see one. The one that's docked is called the SS Jeremiah O'Brien. It's the last one in existence. I called down, talked to a retired Navy man. He told me what year it was built, what battles it had fought in, and I let the guy talk for four or five minutes before I finally asked him the one question I really wanted to know. I said, what can you tell me about its size? Now, this guy did not know me from Adam, but the next words out of his mouth were, do you own a Bible? I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, well, if you'll open it up to the book of Genesis, you can find the dimensions for this ship. I said, how's that? He said, they built the entire fleet to the dimensions of Noah's Ark. I said, why'd they do that? He said, because they wanted to have large ships that could carry heavy loads through rough seas. Now, think about that for just a moment. Our Navy patterned a blueprint for the dimensions of an entire fleet from Noah, who got his blueprint from who? From God. One of the funnest times I ever had, I think I was in South Dakota, I had a, a heckler, a, uh, an atheist guy who was sitting there, was talking about the boat, the ark, and, and he kept, I kept hearing him say, ah, it wouldn't have floated, it wouldn't have floated. And I knew I had this information in my PowerPoint, so I was just patiently waiting. Every, about every two or three, ah, that thing wouldn't have floated. Okay. When I got here, and I gave a little bit of background about the Liberty ships, I looked right at him, I said, crazy thing. You know, those Liberty ships floated just like the ark would have. Same dimensions. He didn't say a whole lot after that. It's, it's interesting to me how skeptics, they, they're quick to throw stuff out there, to ridicule, to make fun of. But when you start pressing them with evidence, here's what I found. Rarely will they say, ah, okay, I was wrong. You're right. They do what I call shotgunning. You guys ever, some of you guys went dove hunting recently, right? You use little bitty pellets. You got pellets all over the place. Well, that's what they do. You answer this question, do they concede the point? No, they, they start throwing out other questions. How big was this thing? So this is the Ark Encounter up in Kentucky that was built to the dimensions using a, an 18-inch cubit. Hopefully you guys can see the people at the bottom of the screen. That's a big boat, y'all. Now, I don't care how you look at it. That's a really big boat. Now, I've asked this question in the past, and I'm going to remind you of it. Did Noah have to take adult animals on the boat? Could he have taken juveniles? Wouldn't take up as much space. Probably wouldn't eat quite as much. You, you want animals that have a long reproductive life ahead of them, right? To replenish the earth. So think about that for just a moment. Now you've got smaller animals. Somebody says, okay, but still he wouldn't have had enough time to build a boat that big. I mean, you know, Brad, that, that, that boat you're looking at right there, that took Ken Ham like three to five years. All right, let's, let's look at how long he did have. Look at the very last verse of Genesis chapter 5 with me. Genesis chapter 5, we're given a, a time element. 
It says Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, so he's, he's 500 years old. Now skip down and look with me, starting in verse 3 of chapter 6. It says, The Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for indeed he is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, there are some folks that teach that that's when God limited lifespans to 120 years. I don't believe that. Uh, the reason I don't believe that is because if you actually look at some of the genealogies in the Bible, there were men who were living to 300, 400 years after that statement is made. So, for instance, you've got the flood right here. You've got 433 years, 464, 235, 233, 230, 148. A lot of people living past 120, right? You say, all right, Brad, then, then what's the 120? I think that was a probationary period God was giving them to clean it up. Remember, the thoughts of man were on evil continually. And we ask ourselves, okay, was there any other instance in God's word where he, he gave, say, a city a probationary period? The answer? Yeah. What about Nineveh? Does he say, uh, you got a certain amount of time to clean it up? Yeah. So 500 years old, he gives them a probationary period of 120 years. Now look with me at Genesis chapter 7, verse 6. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters were on the earth. 500 years old, God says the thoughts of man are on evil continually. I'm going to destroy everything. You got 120 years. Noah didn't need 120 in fact, there was a book that was written several years ago by a guy named Henry Morris where they did the math. And they showed where four people, four men, could have cut, dressed, and installed about 15 cubic feet of lumber per day. Here's what that means. That means if they had worked six-day weeks, rested on the Sabbath, they could have cut, dressed, and installed about 4,680 cubic feet of lumber per year. You do the math, that boat would have needed about 380,000 cubic feet of wood, which means they could have completed the job in just 81 years. And that's if he didn't hire any of it out. So do I think from a scientific, physiological perspective, that he could have gotten the job done? Absolutely. Now, now let me ask it a different way. Do I think God ever gives us a command that we're unable to do? Think about that one for just a minute. Because we've been given commands. And I think sometimes instead of doing the commands... What we do is we kind of maybe throw up excuses. Well, you know, we, yeah, we'll, we'll do some evangelism later. We, we got this, we got virus. Let me ask you something. What do you think would have happened if the coronavirus hit two months after Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross? Be serious with yourself. Do you think that all those early Christians would have just sat around and thought, you know what? What we really do need, we, we need to, we need to be fired up, but but we're gonna wait to tell people about Jesus. Folks, I think they were so on fire that you couldn't shut them up. And whether it was one-on-one -on -one or today's time, whether it was through Zoom. I think they wanted to talk to people about Jesus Christ. Whether there was a coronavirus or not, they were going to turn the world upside down because they knew that there was a guy in a tomb and three days later, it was empty. 
Somebody says, okay, yeah, but still, Brad. At, at the, yeah, go ahead. I think getting animals onto a boat, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if, if God can miraculously parade animals in front of Adam to be named, do I think he can miraculously get them on a boat? Yeah. Say that again. And God closed the door of the boat. Absolutely. Well, I, I think probably one of the biggest, if we want to call it a I don't know if it'd fall under miracle or just under the, the safety of God. I think the flood, the, the deluge, was a lot worse than sometimes we, you know, we... We think about rain, and maybe we think a storm, or, or maybe we even think about tropical storm, hurricane kind of stuff. I think this was the wrath of Almighty God. Windows of heaven opening... You got water coming up from the fountains of the great deep, and I think he was wreaking havoc on this creation. And the very fact that they made it safely in a boat, I think that's a pretty big deal. I, I've been out on water when there were some choppy seas. And in fact, my middle son Reese and I, we were the only ones that fished that day. Everybody else was chumming the waters, if you know what I'm saying. A lot of seasickness. About six to eight foot waves, and that's just six to eight feet. Imagine for just a moment a global flood from an angry God. I think that's a big deal. Um, male and female, you know? How do you get a male animal, female animal, pair them up and get them on the boat? So, yeah, I, I do think that there were, had to be the hand of God in this whole thing. Good question. Other questions, comments? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, when you look at how long they were on actually on the boat, okay, we think 40 days, 40 nights of rain, but if you actually do the math, look at all the time periods that he, you're given. He sends out a raven. He sends out a dove. He sends out a dove again. He, all these different time periods. They're on the boat for like 300 and I think it's 74 days, just over a year. I, I think pro, I'm kind of like you. Is it possible that God allowed some of those animals to go into a, a state of hibernation? Absolutely. Um, he does it today. We're entering fall. There's a lot of animals that we're not going to see in about six weeks. Some of you in this room, you really, really like snakes. <laughs> some of you don't like snakes. About six weeks from now, once the frost comes in, guess what? They're going to start going underground and hide out and they're going to wait on you till next year okay if they can do that and basically go into a, a state of hibernation where they stay warm underground is it possible that animals can get on a boat and do the same thing we've got bears that do it we've got all kinds of creatures that are able to go into a yeah I think so good comments other thoughts questions ratio yes they do absolutely because they know that boat's got to be able to settle into the water and those dimensions have been proven so absolutely I think part of where we're coming into a problem especially with our young people is they have been bred this idea that that early man is dumb right that early man was 
Neanderthal, caveman-like creature. In fact, you know, young people today think, well, if you don't have a smartphone, you're kind of dumb. And I'm looking at some of these young people thinking, well, <laughs> you know, you can't communicate. Some of y'all, like, don't even know how to change a tire without doing this right here. So just because they weren't holding a smartphone doesn't mean people were dumb. In fact, the fact that some of their buildings are still standing today, that's a pretty big deal. You look at the pyramids. You look at some of the, the ancient ruins that are still around. Um, if I ask you, when did, when did man actually acquire intelligence? What do you think? Turn with me back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to give you three things that I want you to remember. Okay? I'm going to be back next week, so I may test you. Three things that Adam possessed on that first day. Look with me at verse 15. The Lord God took man, put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Point number one, Adam was industrious enough and able to work. In fact, he was expected to work. Okay? Keep that one in mind. Look at the very next verse. The Lord God commanded a man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Point number two, man was smart enough to know right from wrong. God says, you see all these thousands of acres? That's for you, Adam, but not this one. Now skip down to verse 20. So Adam gave name to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. So there, there's Adam. The implication being he's not to just name the animals. He's to remember that name and then pass it on to his offspring. Now those three things that I just named, okay, industrious enough to work, able to, smart enough to name the animals, no right from wrong, all three of those. Do you realize all three of those events happened before Eve was fashioned? Because she hadn't been formed yet. And so when I ask you, when did man acquire intelligence, the answer is from the very beginning. And yet, sadly, what our kids are thinking is, oh, you know, Neanderthal man, Lucy. I mean, already Genesis chapter 4, you got people who were making musical instruments, smelting metals. It talks about Jubal, the father of all those who play the harp and the flute. Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And so here we are just a, a few short generations from Adam and already you got people who are smelting metal and making musical instruments. So the next time somebody tells you that Noah wouldn't have been smart enough, like I said, those pyramids, they didn't make themselves. How do you move some of these rocks without a bulldozer, caterpillar, front-end loader? With slaves. Or you hitch them to a dinosaur. <laughs> I'm looking at a clock, and I have already, I, I just got warmed up. Um, I am going to be with you guys. We're going to kind of be together for several weeks, off and on. Um, looking forward to it. Want this to be hopefully very educational, very informal, to where we can kind of have some Q&A. Uh, we'll cover two or three different topics, but it has been a pleasure being with you tonight, and I think they're going to ring a bell on me.
auditorium, so we'll begin our devotional tonight. We're going to begin uh, by singing a couple verses of the song, Live for Jesus, and then uh, Brad will come back and extend the invitation this evening. Let's sing together. Bible, please open it up to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, look with me starting in verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and he preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering walked in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. It says, There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes I think we are guilty of looking, kind of narrowing down on a specific account in God's Word, so much so that we forget the overall big picture. And so for just a, a minute of your time, I want to zoom back out and remind you what the big story really is all about. The big story is all about the fact that God loved men so much. He, he made a garden. He put a man and a woman in that garden to be with them. The text actually says God was walking through the midst of the garden with them. And sin separated us from him. In Genesis chapter 3, we have that account where the woman ate, she turned to the man, gave to him to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God can't be God, a holy God, and have anything to do with sin. And so now we live in a fallen world. The entire rest of this book, all the way through the flood to the end of the book is trying to tell us how to get back into that covenant relationship with God. Ultimately through Jesus Christ. He's not walking the earth today. So you say, how do I come in contact with him? The Bible says that we are buried with him in baptism. And so tonight, if you haven't done that and you realize that sin has separated you from your creator and you're craving that reconciliation if you realize that yes if you were to die tonight that you would be outside of his children and you want to fix that you're ready to repent of your sins to confess his name to be immersed for the remission of your sins you can do that this evening but tonight I want to talk to the rest of you those of you who are Christians because I suspect there's a lot in this room who over the last six months you have been wrestling with things like depression you've been wrestling with things like isolation wondering you know where is God during times like this and I want to remind you God is right where he was during that flood 
And he's right where he was when his son was being nailed to a cross. He loves you. He cares for you. And if you're here tonight, and maybe you're just kind of feeling down, you need some prayers. Maybe you have stepped off of that narrow way and you've allowed the world to kind of infect your life. Here's what we want to do. We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. We want to help you to get back onto that narrow way. We're going to sing this song of encouragement. If you have any need, we hope that you'll come as together we stand and we sing. Appreciate the attendance of everyone, and I invite you to come back and be with us at every opportunity that you have to be here. We will meet on Sunday at uh, 9 o'clock and 1030. We invite you to be a part of our worship time then as we come together again to study God's Word. What announcements do we have this evening? Anybody have an update on JT or on Julie Fast or anything? Yes. Okay. So that's understandable. So JT had his second uh, treatment in this round today. He said, and uh, he's doing okay. But sometimes these things can be hard on you. Um, a few days after the treatment is is concluded. So please keep JT in your prayers. Jeanette is. Uh, um, doing okay, recovering, but still having to motivate herself to do her exercises to get those knees working and, and uh, keep things going. So please keep them in your prayers. Any other announcements that we need to make tonight? Okay. Okay. Billy's mom has elected not to have the surgery that uh, they've been talking about for several months, I believe, right? Okay, so it's too, too evasive, and uh, so she's at peace with that. So please keep Billy Hall's mother uh, in your prayers. Anything else before we dismiss? 
Brad, thank you for being here. We look forward to seeing you next few weeks. Appreciate you coming tonight. And all of your followers here. This is a great crowd of young people. Man, this is awesome. See all these, uh, all these teenagers and young people here tonight. Glad you're here. Let's bow. Yes. Lock them up and keep them. Y'all watch out. Billy will lock you up now. Some of them will get them. Yep. And you be, be careful. He's a taxidermist, so watch out. Let's bow in prayer. Holy Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessings that we have and to be able to come together and to study your word, to sing to you, to uh, lift up our prayers before you. And Father, we're so grateful for Brad and his uh, ability to teach and, and preach and for the study that he has done over the years. And we pray that you will bless him and his family uh, as he goes about uh, striving to teach others the truth about your word and about history as it relates to, to your word. And Father, we pray that you'll bless this church. We long to be together again, Father, all of us in one place. And we pray that um, through your providence and with your blessings that we can do that again soon. Father, we ask that you be with us tonight as we depart and bring us back together again on Sunday as we come together to worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.